Hello, everybody. Welcome all. Uh, a good afternoon, good evening, uh, as well as a good morning to everybody for all those who are joining from different locations across the world. Uh, today, we have our 3AI expert talk series kicking off uh, with the first session, which is specifically on the topic reinforced learning with business applications. This session is being streaming live today. And uh, uh, in this talk, we will be specifically introducing what we call reinforced learning. Now, reinforced learning is, is something which we, which we say it's a specialized subdomain of machine learning, artificial intelligence. It has been, it has been uh, used and being popular for achieving superhuman performance in chess, Go, real-time strategy games. But also, uh, reinforced learning is also applicable to numerous other domains that have more business relevance. Example, it could be in terms of the customer journey mm -hmm. optimization, the item recommendation, the overall predictive man uh, maintenance, or, or what we call, whether it's in manufacturing, finance, retail, there are empty number of examples where reinforced learning is being used. Today, we will be talking about specifically its, uh, its uh, use uh, in, in the retail uh, world. And for that, we have George Silva, who is the Senior Manager for Machine Learning at SAS. Uh, just to give a brief introduction about George Silva. Uh, George, first of all, welcome uh, to this session. I'll just do a quick introduction about you, and then I'll hand over the mic to you. Uh, George Silva has been with SAS since 2012. Uh, he's currently the senior manager of machine learning server development team. Uh, he has, and the, the, if I just talk about the team, the team has delivered a broad portfolio under his leadership of analytic methods, including recommender systems, Bayesian optimization, neural networks, reinforced learning, to, to name a few. Uh, apart from that, besides developing enterprise software, uh, George Silva holds multiple US patents and has authored numerous research publications also. Uh, he has also, uh, he is he is serving uh, an adjunct faculty in the uh, computer science department at the University of North Carolina, where he teaches graduate and undergraduate students machine learning. Uh, George, just to uh, also talk about a few more things around George. George Silver received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering and has been continued to be uh, involved in academics and as a senior research scientist at D Duke University. Uh, he developed a novel machine learning method there, uh, several methods for large scale problems, including unsupervised learning analysis of high dimension data, recommender systems and social networks. So George, we are pretty excited uh, to, to have you here. And before I do that, I also want to thank our knowledge partners, SAS and Intel, uh, for helping us uh, 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 arranging this session uh, with, with George. So, so George, uh, uh, over to you. And I'm looking forward to your expert thoughts. I'll just be on uh, camera off so that to have a, a better focus for you and your session. Thank you very much, Kapil. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak to you all. So it is a pleasure and it is my pleasure to talk about reinforcement learning today. And the first thing I will do is share my screen. Let's make sure that everybody can see the presentation, hopefully. All right. So. I will be talking about reinforcement learning. I'll be giving a brief introduction and uh, it's excited to present some business applications to you. You may, if you have followed recent developments and recent news in, 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 in the past few years, you know, like Kapil has mentioned, reinforcement learning achieves superhuman performance in Atari games, several board games, chess first, and more recently Go which is a far more challenging problem. And uh, more recently, also uh, real-time strategy games. That's uh, what happens with AlphaStar. That's exciting. That's a very good showcase for AI. But these are games. Can RL also achieve good performance in real business problems? Uh, George, uh, 
just to interrupt for some reason we are not able to see the slides could you just check please oh absolutely i'm very sorry no issues uh, let me just oh okay i see what's going on i forgot to press one button okay. how about now yeah we can see now thank you perfect thank you <laughs> i'm glad that you are uh, for the timely inter inter interruption it would have been bad to go over 20 slides without <laughs> <laughs> no issues Thanks. all right so essentially we want to uh, see how reinforcement learning does in other contexts not just games let's first introduce uh, reinforcement learning and let's situate machine uh, reinforcement learning in the broader context of machine learning there are many types of machine learning as you probably are aware the most common types are supervised learning in which you have uh, features and labels and supervised learning where you only have features, but you may want to find groupings or you want to find alternative representations of your data. You have semi-supervised learning, where you have a mixture of labeled and unlabeled data. And then you have in its own little category, you have reinforcement learning, which solves a different problem altogether. It is a decision-making uh, type of technique. And uh, it relies on a continuous interaction between an agent, which is the model that we want to train. It is the agent is the one doing the learning and an environment, which essentially is a simulator of the real world. Or in the case of games, it's a simulator of the rules. Uh, but in the case of a business process, it would be a simulator so that allows the agent to perform what if analysis. So this is a continuous cycle. The agent takes actions and the actions affect the environment. And the, the environment then gives the agent feedback. The feedback is essentially two things. The state, which is some numerical representation of the world at a particular time, and an instant reward, which is, is uh, how what was the score of this uh, after taking this action? And the goal of the agent is to maximize not necessarily the score in the short term, but the cumulative reward over the long term. So that's the main focus of reinforcement learning. It's a sequential decision-making process. Uh, I will not be showing equations the, the, through, this, through the, the, the presentation, so bear with me. This is the only equation I intend to show. But there's a couple of important concepts. The state at time t, the action taken by the agent at time t, the in immediate reward at time t, and then what's called the value function, which depends on the state, and what's called the policy, which uh, gives you uh, a, a measure, a score for each action at time t. Those are the most important concepts uh, in uh, uh, reinforcement learning from a technical point of view. A policy is really what we get when the agent learns. It is a model that tells you what action to take at the time t when your certain state is observed. It's a map from state to an action. Uh, it can be either stochastic or deterministic. This is think about it why would you ever uh, want a policy that can take a random a randomized action from a particular state imagine that you are a fighter pilot and you are uh, in a dog fight with an enemy fighter pilot in the air you don't want to be too, predi too uh, uh, predictable you want to sometimes take random actions so that the, the your counterpart does not is not able to predict your position. So this is just an example of where stochastic policy might be useful. In any case, the goal is always to maximize long-term value. If uh, and the main equation that really is the most important in all the field of machine learning, it's called the Bellman equation, and uh, all it is, without details, I'll just say it is uh, an average an expected value for the future times of discounted immediate rewards, where the discount factor is this gamma over here. And if you know finance, if you are uh, familiar with the concept of net present value, this is very similar. In general, 
you want to maximize long-term cumulative rewards, but instant rewards are more valuable. So it's better to have a few dollars now than to have more dollars in the future. Although what you want is to have more dollars overall, but uh, you know, future rewards uh, are less, are discounted by, by a certain factor. Great. This is just to set up what reinforcement learning is and how it is a decision, uh, uh, basically a sequential decision-making model. But you hear often about deep reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning has been around for decades. It's much, it's much older than deep learning and deep neural networks. Uh, and it was not used necessarily with neural networks in the beginning. However, it actually is a very good match for reinforce for deep learning for the following reason. You need, since you need to try to estimate the value of each action at time t, that means you need a function approximator. And it just so happens that deep neural networks are excellent function approximators, which with a good, well-trained neural network, you have a very good model, good map from state to action. That's all it is. Think about it as a good interpolator that allows you to very well estimate the value of, uh, of every possible action at a particular state. So that's the combination of deep, uh, deep learning with reinforcement learning often is called deep reinforcement learning. Uh, another way to give context is to uh, contrast action with perception. So with deep reinforcement learning, you have, it's more than a classifier. So with deep learning in isolation, you're able to look at this image and say, oh, okay, the object in this image is a tiger. Great. Typical machine learning, supervised learning with, the, with deep neural networks will just stop here. However, if you are in the decision-making process, um, I don't know about you, but if I see a tiger in front of me, my action will be to run away. So, and that is the role of this other model, this policy, this neural network that you see in the bottom, is to take this, whatever information you, ha you have about the state and decide what action you can take. So this is the really how deep learning and reinforcement learning can play together. All right. Now, let me show you, hopefully you can see this video. This is what's called, it's a toy problem. It's what's called the cart pole example where you, the, let me just put it here. What you have is a problem where you try to balance a vertical pole on top of a cart and uh, the, the pole is not attached to the cart. So basically what, what you have is a, a problem where you need to balance it. Otherwise the pole will fall down. What actions can you take? Really you have uh, two actions, left and right. You can move the cart to the left or to the right. And you need to keep doing this continually. Otherwise the pole will fall due to gravity. And it seems like a very simple problem. It's actually fairly challenging from a mathematical point of view. And uh, it requires a quite a great deal of experimentation. After training for 200 episodes, you see that you are able to keep the, the pole vertical for a longer time, which is good. So that gives you higher reward. After training for 500 episodes, it can stay long enough to, to finish with, uh, you know, long enough to be declared a success. So that is a, just an example. And you see, you saw probably two, two strategies that are winning strategies. Either you take very short but frequent left and right movements that will balance the pole, or you take more oscillating longer movements that will also balance the pole. You will also notice that uh, it's a, much more of a success when the cart doesn't fly off either to the left or to the right hand side of the image. So this is a very much a toy problem, but uh, it is a benchmark for any algorithm in the reinforcement learning. Another example, what's called the Lunar Lander. This is one of the Atari games, and there is a variety uh, of Atari games that again serve as a benchmark for reinforcement learning uh, algorithms. Here. Your goal is to land a spaceship on the surface of the moon between two flags. Your state is uh, 
you based on the the image your state is the x and y position of the spaceship in the in the in the image as well as the velocity the angle of orientation and a few other state variables your actions are there are four possible actions either left thruster right thruster the main thruster which is vertical or do nothing and the goal is to land between the flags bonus points if the two legs of the, the spacecraft touch the ground simultaneously and obviously do it at a low speed so that you don't crash and uh, again this is a challenge a more challenging problem than it seems uh, let me show you here uh, very quickly what happens when the model is not well trained yet you essentially crash over and over again uh, Note, as far as the reward, you gain bonus points for uh, you know, staying up and for spending less fuel, which is an additional complication of the problem. So clearly, uh, it needs training to do anything worthwhile. And uh, now, if I show you a properly trained example, oh, I'm sorry about that. This is, OK, this is an expected. One moment. Hopefully, uh, sorry about that. Uh, let me continue. Now, this is what happens after you have been properly trained. And you see a properly trained policy is able to land the spacecraft every time. And note that there is variability in the environment. Uh, you are not going to be to get away with just recording a preset a set of instructions because the if you do that your trajectory will never be the same twice uh, in a row all right let me end this and let me see if i still have a working presentation uh, all right apologies for that it's fortunately as a plan B, I believe I can fix that easily enough. Hopefully, you can still see my screen and I'll get my slides back up in a second. All right. Are you able to see my slides again? Yes, George, we can see. George. Excellent. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. So, Again, sorry for that little interruption. No Let me get back to where I was. And here, one more second. Very good. Ah, there's one. Ah, OK, pressed too many buttons. <laughs> All right. Let me try again. And hopefully, ah, there we go. Another aspect I would like to point out. You need an environment. What you saw was the performance of the agent when it is able to train and com by communicating continuously with an environment. And uh, uh, at SAS, we have a reinforcement learning package and uh, we that covers not just training the agent, but also the environment itself. And we connect with the standard uh, platform for environments, which is OpenAI Gene. And uh, this is just an example of how you could implement your own uh, custom environment by defining a step and a reset function that's, you know, even in a language like Python, you could do, you could do this for a custom environment that is relevant to your business problem. But what I showed you so far has been games. Uh, either the cart pole or the lunar lander. Can we do more with RL? Definitely, yes. Similar techniques can be used in many industries. For instance, reinforcement learning is these days, it is the state of the art for recommender systems. Uh, based on the history of, cust of, the, of, the, of the customer, either interacting with items or a browsing history of a customer in your website, uh, reinforcement learning has, right now, it's better performance than the classical uh, collaborative filtering systems that try to solve the, the item recommendation problem. And this is just a 
uh, an academic reference for uh, for uh, deep reinforcement learning using for in, for recommending pages and assets on web pages finance now obviously i don't know about you but if anybody told me that there is a, an optimal way to perform sequential decision making i would immediately try it on the stock market let's uh, and that that has been tried there's a, a algorithmic trading based on reinforcement learning is definitely a very active area of research. Uh, the actions at the particular time step might be buy, sell, or hold a share, or increase the, um, the, the percentage of a particular asset in the portfolio. And uh, that is a, a very active area of research, as you can imagine, but also, very different uh, area, HVAC control. So you have a building and you try to maintain a comfortable temperature of, for your air conditioning system in your building while minimizing energy usage. And uh, by having, and there exist commercial environments, that's an, an interesting aspect of uh, uh, HVAC control, is that the Department of Energy uh, provides a well-known physics-based simulation of a building which allows you to train an agent and uh, give actions to the to simulated building and receive realistic feedback of what would be the temperature and the energy expenditure of that build, building over time. So, and that is, we have actually tried this in one of the buildings at the, at the SAS campus with the promising results. Additionally, for predictive maintenance, uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, anomaly detection and condition-based monitoring, um, that is already a much uh, improved type of strategy versus trying to just rely on scheduled maintenance of, the, of your equipment. Either it's be, it could be a train, it could be a truck, it could be any particular piece of, uh, of, uh, of equipment in a factory. In either case, just relying on scheduled maintenance is wasteful and it might not uh, be uh, timely enough. Uh, Condition-based monitoring, you install sensors and you monitor, you have measurements that may be, allow you to detect problems as they are happening or before they happen. Reinforcement learning allows you to uh, even decide what would be the best maintenance strategy and change it dynamically over time. That allows you to be very efficient in your sensor data collection. And uh, you, it does require that you deploy uh, reinforcement learning policies at the edge. So in the hardware platform close to your piece of equipment. So this is a very exciting field, which is in having seen the, the rapid growth. And uh, more generally, RL and IoT are a perfect match. They're made for each other. Why? Because the environment, which is a simulator of the real system, is really analogous to a digital twin of your piece of equipment. Uh, if you have, for instance, if you have a power plant and uh, you have a very large turbine, that, there are, that's a very big investment. So you can bet that the engineering company that manufactured that turbine has created a physics-based simulator of that piece of equipment which you can leverage and use to train the RL in the environment to decide uh, what kind of regime this turbine should work on and what kind of maintenance strategy you should use. So that is a very promising field. All right, so these are general applications. And for the rest of the time, I would like to focus on a very specific uh, application that we have used at the SAS cafeteria prior to the pandemic, I should say, which is the following. Uh, if you install cameras in a way that allow you to monitor uh, customers in line for the cashier at our cafeteria, you may be able, and this is just an example that is applicable to many retail applications. This could be a supermarket. This could be a, a, a Walmart. Essentially, what this allows you to do is to minimize the waiting time of your customers so that they have the best experience possible. At the same time, trying to you efficiently use your cashiers. How many cashier stations should be open? 
and uh, what is the best time if you're a customer what's the best time to to get lunch so this is a computer vision application uh, together with a reinforcement learning application and uh, let me give you a little bit of a overview again this could be used in grocery stores department stores banks and airports it feels funny to show you these big crowds when we are in the middle of a pandemic and everything is closed but uh, you know we will at some point return to situations where we have the multiple people and where we have to manage retail spaces uh, the overall so the overall pipeline that we are uh, that we have implemented relies on multiple uh, stages you have a computer vision system which really what it does is count how many people it, uh, the, are present in the cafeteria as well as what what are the queue lengths which is the important part of the state here is how big is the queue at each cashier station and how fast is it moving uh, then you know, we need an environment. Remember, this is reinforcement learning. An environment really is based on a time motion study and trying to predict key performance indicators. And uh, for a cashier type of application, that typically requires discrete event simulation. So it's simulation based. Finally, once you have a good simulator and once you have a good sensor collection uh, platform, that allows you to, to do real time control using reinforcement learning. With the goal, you have to define a good reward function, which takes into account minimizing the waiting time of your customers and also trying to use as few cashiers as possible for efficient operation. And uh, the results have been pretty promising. So this is just uh, some technical details of the computer vision system. You have a stream coming out of a CCTV camera. You need to crop. Uh, this this needs to be done automatically. This needs uh, the system needs to automatically crop people, decide if whether or not there are people and how many. Uh, you need you typically use uh, pre-trained uh, models, which then you have adapt to your setting by doing transfer learning. And the YOLO is the type of model that is being used here. Uh, when you do transfer learning and you're training the model to perform well in your setting, you may want to do some manual uh, labeling. Uh, that is, that depends on your application, really. We had to do it because of the angle of the camera and the size of the people was not, we could not use the pre-trained model without doing some, uh, some additional training. And uh, there are some excellent tools that help you label your data. And then you apply your detection model and now you what you have once you know that there are people and where they are in your image you just have a multiple object tracking problem for which there are well-known solutions okay and by the way esp stands for uh, uh, event stream processing it's the SaaS platform that allows you to do uh, real-time processing uh, in this case of videos uh which basically you end up with little bounding boxes around everybody. And then using uh, some additional processing, you can actually have tracks, you know, the trajectory of each person in the cafeteria, which can be a useful piece of information on its own. You can have heat maps of what are the high traffic areas around the cafeteria. I don't know about you, but here, let me tell you, I've been here multiple times. This area this hot spot here is the dessert station and i'm there all the time when i when i'm in the cafeteria and finally uh that allows you to detect the length of the queue by seeing how many people are stopped and in line all behind each other with the little clustering algorithm you can do that fairly easily so position and velocity data computer vision tracking and counting people looking at queue lengths, all this pipeline. You can even have a dashboard using our vision analytics that show you the KPIs as a function of time. What are, how many customers so far? How long are they waiting uh, at particular times? So you see peak hours, 12 to 12, 12, 15. And how many customers have been uh, processed? Remember, step number two here is the simulator. 
That means discrete event simulation, you start with, uh, a, you generate a synthetic customer. So pretend that the customer just arrived and then waits in a queue for a particular amount of time, which is random. Uh, then the payment is processed. So that's when the person arrives at the head of the queue to the cashier and pays. And finally, heads to the tables and leaves the field of view of the camera. So this is the disposer stage. So by simulating this based on real data for, for an extended period of time, you could come up with a static schedule where you say, OK, I don't have a lot of movement here, so I'll just have two cashiers here at peak hours and one cashier here. That is a possible um, strategy. It's simple, but it's suboptimal essentially this is just a, a, a view of the uh, interface for creating the environment which is really based on the sas simulation studio this is this discrete event simulator not going over all of this and it gives you again for when you have one cashier only it gives you much much larger checkout times versus when you have two cashiers where which uh, you know it's only one person difference but it makes the queues flow much much faster so this is evident from the simulation results and uh, now how does reinforcement learning fit here reinforcement learning is going to take the following decision at a particular five minute period do i have one active cashier or two active cashiers and uh, that's the action that is taken. Environment will give us back what is the queue length. And the immediate reward is related to the cost of waiting on one hand, because that's a measure of the quality of service, but also of the cost of having an additional cashier, which uh, you know that has operational costs. That person might be doing something else. This is for the training stage. When we train the agent, we no longer need the, the reward, but you still need the current state. So now you have those uh, computer vision tracking metrics. How many people, what is the queue length and waiting time, et cetera. And uh, this is just a graphical representation of the policy. And this is just really uh, an interesting depiction of uh, the, the trained policy, what it does. It decides, and this was automatically trained, whenever the number of uh, arrivals is higher than a certain number and the queue length is also getting higher, switch to the orange regime, which is two cashiers. Otherwise, stay with one cashier. And this is, we have compared this to the fixed schedule and to uh, additional other, other uh, strategies for deciding the number of cashiers. What you see in this plot is reinforcement learning compared to supervised learning and many different fixed schedules based on just simulation, as well as the uh, random policy, which is just to flip a coin, decide between one or two cashiers. This is a very small problem, but it's already very obvious that reinforcement learning has the lowest, by far the lowest cost of all possible approaches. And the, the, here the cost is average waiting time plus a factor that depends on the number of cashiers to account for operational costs. So even on such a relatively small problem, reinforcement learning is already the optimal uh, solution. And only scale as you scale this up to more cashiers and the bigger retail space, this is only going to be even more the case. And uh, the now, for uh, just some interesting uh, visuals of the system in operation and uh, how this can be deployed on the edge. So the, the computer vision system can actually run on a much smaller computer than the, than the computers that were uh, used to train the model. This was done on the Jetson board. And uh, one additional aspect here that's specific to the computer vision thing is uh identity protection you don't necessarily want to keep a record of everybody and keep videos of everybody in the cafeteria because that's not the all you need, want from here is count people so to protect the privacy of the customers uh, this system actually masks them so that you cannot recognize their faces or their clothes 
And this is an identity protected object tracking application that we have uh, implemented. And this cafeteria system has uh, this reinforcement learning and computer vision application has been featured on the NBC Today show. And uh, so that's uh, something that made us very, very happy. All right, so to wrap up, I just, um, the main takeaway message is that you can use reinforcement learning for a lot more things than just games. And I'd like to leave you with a few resources, some selected papers by members of my, of my team. Uh, this particular one is a NIRIPS paper from last year where we used reinforcement learning for traffic signal control, trying to make uh, better use of uh, artificial intelligence to decide whether or not to give people a red line or the green line with the green light in the traffic intersections. Also, uh, we have this paper under review, which is a, a, a survey paper of uh, multi-agent deep reinforcement learning. And also I'd like to leave you a few links for resources uh, about reinforcement learning at SAS. And I will stop here for questions. Thank you. Thank you, George, uh, for an engaging and insightful session. I uh, personally enjoyed it, uh, based on the knowledge I carry. So I was uh, specifically looking into the ta takeaways which came in out of this. Uh, I think you fantastically covered the overall deep reinforcement journey, uh, the reinforcement learning journey, as well as the deep in reinforcement learning thing which you talked about and how you can combine the deep reinforcement learning with reinforcement learning. Uh, you also talked about uh, the the different examples, right? The card pole example, which you talked about, and the the lunar uh, landing example. That was something which was very interesting to me because I have been very much inclined towards the solar system and the way these uh, um, I I would not say instruments, but these things work. And, and uh, uh, when when I saw this example, which you mentioned, uh, while a very simple example, it was yet very powerful in terms of connect, connecting it very well in terms of how does the overall reinforcement learning work. Uh, then the other thing which you talked about is the IoT piece, right? So whenever we talk about the systems which are there and then we talk about the overall modeling which is happening there, how these two are talking to each other and how you're making sure that whether it's a grocery store or it's the 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 modeling which is happening in in different areas you talked about uh, this fantastic example uh, wherein uh, you also talked about the the deployment and the uh, 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 other aspects but more importantly also talked about identity protection rights that's another key area which comes in whenever we talk about any deployment of models and how much data which come which comes in and how much uh, we can specifically look into leveraging and and uh, taking it further. Uh, I think it was great. Uh, also, the references you have given, we will also, um, uh, it's, it's a good thing uh, which can be shared with the respective people who are really interested in this. A couple of questions uh, which are coming up through the various channels where this is being streamed, uh, George. One is that uh, I was in another session where uh, there is always this discussion on what is the best model which fits to the purpose but also in terms of the different models and the deployments which happen, how does how do companies actually really take care of the cost piece which comes in in this? So could you share some light around this? How does the the uh, cost as compared to other models, other similar models which come in? How does that really look like? So that is a very good question. Uh, all these models are data and compute hungry. They require you to spin up cloud instances and uh, compute for quite some time. Uh, and that is costly, not just in terms of money and compute per hour, but also in terms of energy. Uh, yeah. Training a single deep learning, this is not just reinforcement learning, any deep learning model that you train for many days spends as much carbon as a, a car in its entire, as one to five cars in their entire lifetime. Right. So, this to me shows that you need to be more efficient on how you use models and really, really, really brings up the value of transfer learning. You, mm. want, you want to rely on pre-trained models as much as possible so that you, which you can download, you can download entire or pre-trained neural networks 
And then you can adjust them to your business setting by just running a few hours instead of multiple days of training. That's transfer learning. You start from a pretty good solution, but then make it specific to your business domain by training with your data. But now with you, you can train for a much shorter time and using far less data. OK, great. No, great. Uh, the other question which is specifically coming in is how is the assessment of uncertainty different in reinforcement learning? So reinforcement learning, one of the powers of reinforcement learning is that it makes very few assumptions. It, uh, it is typically model free. It mm -hmm. does not, uh, and, and you do expect uncertainty. You, do, you, you don't necessarily expect that if you take the same action in the same state, you don't necessarily get always the same next state. Right. You can have different uh, positions. So your policy needs to be robust. And uh, it's, it's like when you are trading in the long term. You don't care about any particular deal. You care about the cumulative result of many, many, many deals. Here, that's what reinforcement learning tries to do. It tries to do a policy that may not always take the optimal action at any particular time. That's not what it's trying to do. It's trying to bring the system to a state where future rewards will be much better. Mm -hmm. So that's how to deal with uncertainty. And if you think about customer satisfaction, it's the same thing. You don't necessarily want to charge a lot of money to that customer, even if he buys it, because that may, yes, you may get more money for that deal, but then the customer will not be happy. So they will not come back. You want to bring the customer to a state of being happy so that they keep coming back to you and your long lifetime value for your customer is higher. Great. No, great. Uh, so, so you also talked about, uh, George, uh, somewhere there was a mention around what we call digital twin, and there has been a lot of discussion around digital twin, a lot of definitions around digital twin. Uh, so what, uh, uh, when you mentioned digital twin, was there a specific reference or certain things which you wanted to mention? Uh, in terms of what exactly digital twin and the connecting dots with reinforcement learning? Absolutely. So I would say a digital twin in the context of IoT is really a simulation platform that allows you to try out different strategies without compromising your physical system. You mm. don't want to do what if exploration analysis uh, with a real nuclear reactor, for instance, just to bring an example. Just like you don't want to learn to fly an airplane by taking random actions while at the cockpit and seeing if the airplane crashes or not. So that's kind of a exaggerated example, but it serves to say that you need a simulator if you are going to do exploration and what if analysis. And it just so happens that the digital twin in the context of IoT, very often it's precisely that. It's a simulation of a particular piece of equipment or a particular process. And uh, if you think about it, reinforcement learning is really a generalization of uh, control theory. It's there's a feedback cycle, you exercise a certain control signal, really an action, and your plant or your equipment responds according to its internal state and to its dynamics. So and your digital twin is a representation of your dynamics of your physical piece of equipment or your plant. Okay, so George, uh, uh, also there are uh, audience in this uh, forum who are from uh, universities and institutions. And one of the uh, questions they specifically look into is that if they want to make uh, their career into, of course, machine learning, they're already doing a lot of things there into AI and machine learning. Uh, specifically for reinforcement learning, is that something they need to focus on any tips and tricks where they can get better on this, uh, kind of be part of the uh, the journey there uh, to, to get a start with? Absolutely. So I would say uh, reinforcement learning is exploding. Uh, a couple of years ago, more than 25% of all papers in top machine learning conferences were about reinforcement learning, and it's only getting better. Uh, and that would be my recommendation. Keep up to date with the state of the art. Not books are always good, and the Sutton is the the, the main uh, person that founded founded the field of uh, reinforcement learning. But the the field is moving very fast. 
So NeurIPS is an excellent conference. ICML is an excellent conference. Keep up to date with conferences. Look at the, because the, the proceedings are there. They are, they are free to look at. So keep reading papers as they come in every year. Uh, and this, this, uh, many of those papers come from industry as well as universities. So you get a feel of real applications and uh, how reinforcement learning is being used. So that would be my recommendation. Okay. Uh, another question which is coming on the table is uh, how is explainability deployed in reinforcement learning? Probably you would have given an example, but if you can just share certain details there, that will be helpful. Right, so explainability and interpretability are very hot topics right now in the whole of machine learning. And they are particularly important when you are using black box models such as deep neural networks. And it's easier in, in computer vision because one of the strategies for trying to explain models in computer vision is to visualize in an image which pixels were involved in making the decision. So that's how you can see if, uh, if you're detecting cat versus dog, maybe you're focusing on the ears and the nose. Uh, that's easier to visualize in the computer vision applications. But how about tabular data? How about data that is not computer vision? It's uh, either a stream of sensor data or it's just uh, regular data that comes on the database. That is a very, uh, very challenging field. At SAS, we have an entire set of methods that allow you to explain and uh, and uh, you know and to detect bias in models and try to mitigate bias in models, and the those strategies are typically based on which variables were most decisive in make when the model made a particular decision. So it's essentially a, a question of asking of uh, auditing those decisions, asking why was a certain prediction made? And uh, any explainability model should be able to answer this question. Why was this prediction made? Which variables were most important in making that decision? Great. Uh, you talked about uh, identity protection also, right? And so wherever these, these models are being deployed, there will be this question of how do we make sure that, and even in countries, there are different, uh, uh, I would say, uh, rules and regulations specifically from an identity protection perspective. Uh, anything, any specific tips, how you are ensuring that this is something which is taken care of in the best way? Yes, absolutely. So there are, it's a multi, you need to take multiple fronts for your approach. You need, first of all, to avoid transferring data as much as possible. So, and particularly where the data is located is a very important consideration. Uh, if possible, you might actually want to use synthetic data. And this brings us to a different field, which is very important and which our, our team also handles, which is ge generative adversarial networks for the simple purpose of creating random data that it does not exist, and uh, that, but that still shares the same statistical properties of real data. So that's one way to go. Also, there's an entire field around the differential privacy which allows you to prevent things like from a model trying to reverse engineer what the data would have looked like. Uh, it says it's strangely, in, it's easier than it sounds in, uh, in many situations. So you want the, your models not just to be accurate, but also to be robust to reverse engineering so that an adversary cannot infer what was the data just by looking at your model. So there are techniques for doing so, and uh, it's very important that as an organization, you are able to use these techniques. OK, great. Uh, more of, I don't know if that is a relevant question, but still, if it is as it is coming up, I'll just go in, I'll go ahead with this. Uh, so, so more around, so one is the overall data science layer, where you will run these models, d discuss these things. Then is the overall data engineering layer, right, where the different set of data will be coming in and uh, uh, taken up from there. So specifically, are there any best practice tools? This is more of a question coming in from one of the students. Any best practice tools when it comes to using reinforced learning and these models and then using the relevant extraction tools along with this? Is there any any linkage with that? Any any tools which work better than the other uh, just as a recommendation unbiased? Right. So uh, to be unbiased, obviously, uh, I am a SaaS user. 
and uh, there are many <laughs> <laughs> there are many tools that uh, that allow you to do data data cleaning but it's absolutely right the first step and the, where you will spend most of your time is really in the data collection joining different tables making sure that uh, your data has enough quality does not have missing values does not have garbage in it and uh, that you can collect it at a quick enough pace and store it in a place that's accessible by your uh, reinforcement learning agent so this is definitely a challenge in itself you also need to make it scalable because uh, um, you know you cannot be moving gigabytes of data across the network and expect scalable performance you need to be careful in making sure that your analytics is actually co-located as much as possible with your data to prevent the data transfer uh, when you're using a gpu and training for multiple hours this is particularly important and remember the issue of cost you don't want your uh, compute instance to be spinning up for longer than strictly necessary so definitely this is a, an engineering uh, problem that is not just the machine learning and the algorithms at all it's also the containers the, the how fast the data can be transferred and uh, what is the hardware and software architecture overall uh, uh, if you have multiple if you have a distributed computing system you need to worry about your kubernetes configuration there's a lot of cloud engineering involved i would say okay great now this is a uh, uh, one thing around learning from humans right or imitating humans i'm i'm not sure uh, how much of that i actually want that to be true uh, whether it's it's my wife and, and that happening and that that uh, imitation happening from my wife but uh, inverse rl right is more about learning from humans uh, is that practically feasible to fully imitate humans or is that is there something which well, going on around it and i don't know about fully future. imitating humans but i will say that inverse reinforcement learning is very important in settings where your reward function is not well defined where mm -hmm. you don't you don't have a, a easy way to quantify your reward but you know you want to act as a, like an expert and uh, let me tell you that a field where inverse reinforcement learning is very popular, self-driving cars. Okay. Your reward might obviously be, well, don't crash with other cars and try not to uh, speed, not try not to have to, uh, to match acceleration in your driving behavior. But it's, you can do that and cook a, a, a reward function, or you can go look at examples of good drivers and just imitate them. That's a that's a field where uh, inverse reinforcement learning is uh, is popular. So it's pretty advanced now. And so, what do you think now? How will the future look like in that case? In that case, sorry. Well, trying to predict the future is always a risky proposition. Uh, I will. Right. No, I, I'll make it a more narrower or focused uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, is it more of uh, you see from a specific industry perspective there will be more focus there in terms of doing this and imitating or uh, do you see one versus the other something any thoughts on that and pro by the way that's that's the last question uh, which has come in and so so we can mind up the session also then so i'll say this these days we are witnessing uh, challenges in supply chains we are witnessing shortage of truck drivers for instance mm. and all these things are exercising pressure and there's a big incentive to mitigate those problems. And uh, imagine uh, you are, again, back to self-driving cars. Uh, you are probably aware that there are many companies that have been uh, prototyping and experimenting with self-driving trucks. Advantage, they drive 24 hours, they don't need rest breaks, and uh, you know they're automated. There are still challenges. We are not there yet where we can deploy a fleet of self-driving mm -hmm. trucks. and because there is safety in the road for the other drivers. Right. But uh, that is a very uh, promising uh, field where the uh, where AI can definitely be applied. Hmm. No, great, uh, fantastic thoughts uh, coming up uh, from you, George. And, and we had these plethora of questions also coming in, just showing the engagement level which the audience had for the session which you put up. 
uh, really, uh, I personally enjoyed the session. We also got some great feedback coming in various channels in terms of how the session went. Uh, I also want to thank SAS and Intel for, for this session, for, for being our knowledge partners there. We will have more sessions coming in uh, around difficult to uh, different topical themes around AI analytics. So, uh, George, uh, I will give you the rest five minutes. And uh, thank you so much again for your time. My pleasure. It was a pleasure to be here and present to, to everyone. And yeah. uh, very much a pleasure to answer the very good questions that came in. So thank you so much. Great. Great. Thank you.